was, I was in the fellowship uh, during the fellowship break, and uh, I was talking to Jesse Hoagland, and he said, man, the, the song server's been lit this morning. <laughs> I'm like, you better go ahead, Jesse. You hit. But it's true. The song service has been lit this morning. And uh, what an awesome service we had thus far. I mean, the welcome by Paco and Haley. Let's give it up one more time for Paco and Haley. Uh, you know, Jacob really sharing his heart for communion. Uh, isn't it awesome to see young people come up here and be totally vulnerable and see victory in Christ? Let's give it up for Jacob BB one more time. And I, honestly, after Matt's uh, contribution, I didn't feel like I had to preach anymore, you know? It's, it's just, this Matt, Matthew laid it out for contribution. Let's get up for Matthew Rodriguez. I, you know, we're in Los Angeles here, so I don't think anyone really cares who wins the Super Bowl uh, today. Um, you know, it's funny, Paco, like, any, any Eagles fans, someone like raise their hand a little bit. I see someone right there. Uh, hey, man, praying for you, bro. Um, and uh, any Chiefs fan, someone like raise their hand. But I, I just want to see a good game. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I want to see some people overcome some obstacles this morning. Uh, but that reminded me of the past. Let's go to John 16. Amen. We've had a super service so far. I want to make sure there's a microphone. There we go. John 16, in verse 31. Bible says, do you now believe? Jesus replied, a time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet, I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Here you see, right after the Last Supper, Jesus preaches his last lesson before he prays for the disciples, before his departure. And he ends off his last sermon with a phrase that I believe he hoped that would have been seared in the hearts of the disciples as he heard him, as they heard him preach the word. And that phrase is simply, take heart. I have overcome the world. And I believe if we want to be with God one day, I believe we want to see God in heaven. If we want to be with all the angels one day, worshiping the Lord God for eternity. We too have to have that in our hearts. We too have to have that seared in our minds, that phrase, take heart, I have overcome the world. The title lesson here this morning is simply, We Shall Overcome. You know, it was once said that strength does not come from what you can do, but it comes from overcoming what you once thought you could not do. And I hope this morning that as you come to hear the words of God, that God can inspire you to dream bigger, to live bigger, to obey the Lord, and to see that you could overcome what you thought you could not overcome this morning. Are you guys with me here? I have three simple points. Point number one, whatever it takes. You know, we are celebrating football with the Super Bowl. I'm not the biggest football fan. I, I love basketball more, and I, I'm, a big, I'm a big Laker fan, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Derek Fisher. Uh, the late great Corey Bryant once said, I'll do whatever it takes to win a game, whether it is sitting on a bench, waving a towel, handing a cup of water to a teammate, or hitting the game 
winning shot. See, Kobe had a heart to do whatever it takes to win a basketball game, to surrender his life, to do it, to lay it down. How much more for us to win the ultimate game, the ultimate contest, the ultimate race, the ultimate Super Bowl is the life of a Christian so we can one day go to heaven. My first point, whatever it takes, go to John chapter 5. We're going to be over here in John 5 for most of the sermon. You know, in the book of John, there are seven signs to prove that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Right now, we're going to read sign number three. John 5 and verse 1. The Bible says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool which in Aramaic, it was awesome, we have Yusuf Yunin who does speak Aramaic, is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of pe- disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been invalid for 38 years. But Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for such a long time. He asked him, do you want to get well? You know, it's amazing here. John goes through quite detail to express where this pool was. In 1888, a guy named Kevin Schick, he found this excavation of the pool exactly how it was described here in the book of John. Many commentators and historians did not believe this pool actually existed until 1888. Now we see here from the scriptures, you could have faith that we're not reading some stories. This actually happens. And in this pool, what was known was that it would have healing properties for people so that they could be healed from their diseases. And Jesus comes and finds a man who's been invalid for 38 years. The definition of that is someone made weak or disabled by illness or injury. 38 long years. And Jesus asks him, do you want to get well? Bit of an, if you think about it, a bit of an insulting question right there. <laughs> the guy's been laying here for 38 years. I mean, I've been sick for a couple days sometimes. And the, of course I want to get well. But maybe Jesus sensed something in this guy's heart. Maybe what happened, that this guy just accepted this is how his life was going to be. Maybe Jesus sensed that this guy didn't really want to work to overcome so that he can become well. Or maybe Jesus said this guy was completely hopeless. And he asked him, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Now, how does it apply to the world in our generation? Well, we may not live in a world with people who are absolutely invalid, but we live in a world where people may be spiritually and mentally invalid. For X amount of years, 18 years, 21 years, 40, 55 years, they're putting their hopes in things that they thought will make them well. But sadly, it brought them disappointments. And there are some that think they may even be the exception to the rule, but then one day will find themselves just like this man, hopeless. In June 2020, the CDC released data that suggests one in four adults ages 18 to 24 have considered suicide. And according to the recently released Harvard Youth Poll of over 2,500 Americans ages 18 to 29, 51% of young Americans said they at least had several days in the previous two years where they felt down, depressed, or hopeless. You know, Proverbs 13, verse 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. 
And right now, I believe the Bible is trying to help us see that we still live in a spiritually blind world. We still live in a spiritually lame world. And we still live in a world people are paralyzed in what they do. And maybe that's how you may have felt coming here this morning. That you, you feel like, wow, like where's, where's the next step? I'm looking for something. You maybe feel blind or lame or paralyzed. And God is asking you this morning, just like how he asked this man for 38 years, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Do you want to get well? Let's see what the guy says. You know, there's always excuses. And that's what the guy brings up to Jesus. In verse 7, he says, Sir, the man replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. But I'm trying to get in. Someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up! Pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk. The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leader that it was indeed Jesus who made him well. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? And the man responded with excuses. And sometimes when God asks us, do we want to get well? We can respond with excuses. That God might not be the right time. God, I'm too busy. I have work. I have school. And Jesus says, despite the excuses, he just calls him to obedience. He simply says, Get up and walk. You see, every soul has the power to do what God commands them. God is not going to call you to do something that he doesn't fundamentally think you can do. But the thing is, if this man, even when he heard the word of the Lord over here, and he just said, well, God, if I feel better later, maybe I'll get up and walk. Or, well, God, maybe when I feel like it's right, I'll get up and walk. But he said, no, as soon as he heard the word of God, he said, I am going to get up and walk. And the man stood up and walked. What does it teach us? Everything that may be hindering us today. You can make a decision right now as you're hearing the words of God. Right now, whatever's stopping you. You can make a decision to get up. You make a decision to walk if you simply obey the word of God. You see, God's love language is not lip service. You see, God, God's love language is not just sacrifice. God's love language, it says in 1 John, this is what love, what love for God is, is to obey his commands. I, I, I got to ask you this morning, how is it going obeying the word of the Lord? And it's interesting. I, I can imagine there is many, some other men and women there who were blind, who were lame, and they watched this man get healed. Don't forget, it said many were there. Now, Jesus went to this guy because he knew this guy had faith to be healed. So maybe there are people who were there as well that didn't have faith to be healed. And I, I think in a very real way, we're seeing so many awesome miracles right now in the church. We're seeing so many men raise up and do amazing things. So many women raise up and do amazing things. So many people come up here or all around Los Angeles as Jesus Lord. But some of us could have a bystander effect. And be like the other invalids and see people get healed and say, well, can I be that person? 
Can God heal me? Can I even be the healer? I want to put it before you. Of course you can. God has called you to be healed. God has called you to get up. God has called you to go and say you are the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And anybody can change. And then what happens, he gets persecuted for healing the guy. So backwards. Where he's like, wow, it's a Sabbath. Why are you doing these things? But then he finally sees him again and tells him, stop doing what you've been doing. Stop sinning. Unless something worse will happen to you. I mean, think about that. Like, what, what can be worse than being invalid for 38 years? Well, Matthew 10, verse 28 says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What can be worse than 38 long years of being paralyzed? Is being eternally paralyzed in hell. So Jesus says, stop sinning. Make a decision. And this guy did whatever it took. What does that mean? What, for, for us, whatever it takes is simply to obey God. But the question is, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want to change? How bad do you want to kill that pride? How bad do you want to stop giving into impurity? How bad do you want to change? Can I put it before you? If you want to change, you have to want it. You have to really, really want it. And this guy was sick of it. And he made a decision that nothing was going to stop him. He made a decision that day to simply do whatever it took to change for Christ. So how bad do we want it this morning? You know, um, born and raised in Los Angeles, but my parents are from Nigeria. And uh, I know we have Nigerians everywhere these days. <laughs> one there, one there, one there. <laughs> the whole, the whole over the place. Small to, you know, we're very fruitful. Um, but I've been in Nigeria twice. And I remember the second time I went, one morning, I was just, so you have to understand, there's nice parts of Nigeria. <laughs> uh, in, in the city. So I was there first, then I went to the village. Not so nice. One morning, I wake up, and, and my, 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 my eyes just stuck to the pillow. You know, we haven't, we, I hope, you know, we haven't eaten lunch yet, so I'm going to get a little graphic here. I had mucus stuck to the pillow from my eye. And I had to take it off. And I was like, man, what's going on? And I asked my mom, hey, this just hurts so bad. She told me I had a very bad version of pink eye. They call it Apollo. The next day, I'm walking with my brother. He, he catches it, too. And we're just, we're just walking together in the village. And then we see green mucus come down. And I was like, oh. it's not from my nose. I look in my brother's eyes, it's coming down from his eyes. And he's like, you got it too. And I was like, oh. I can't lie, this hurts so bad. And here's the thing, there's no concept of going to like CVS. You know what I mean? Like, just, you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's literally nothing, there's nothing we can do. So I was just so desperate to change that. So, you know, I cried to my mom, like, Mom, like, what can I do? She said, well, there's one home remedy. I was like, Mom, tell me, please. I want to know the remedy. You sure you want to know? Can you drink this cup? And she told me the remedy. Pee in a cup. I'm going to take a little syringe, put it in the cup, I'm going to put it in your eyes. And my, my brother was a wimp, he's like, no way, mom, we're not, I was like, sign me up for it. 
I'm sick of this. It hurts. Let's just do it. <laughs> so I go, I do it. She puts in my eye, I'm like, ah, like I scream on the top of my lungs, and it hurts so bad. But 20 minutes later, I was well. And it worked. What did it teach me? I was so desperate to change. I did whatever it took to get that pink eye away. I got to ask you this morning, how desperate are you to change? What limit are you not willing to go to the change for Christ? Some of us been here and, and, and have been coming to service after service after service after service. And you know that God is calling you to change something. And you've been delaying it. Why are you delaying it? Why are you resisting the spirit of God? Some of us need to make it so to get restored back to Christ. Some of us are here studying the Bible and saying, man, we got to make a decision, study the Bible every day and make Jesus Lord of our life. If you have no limits, there's nothing that can stop you. If you have no limits, there's no fear. If you're desperate to change, there's nothing you wouldn't not do. And that's where this man was at. I want to challenge us this morning. It's time to get desperate to change. What's been stopping you? Maybe you're like, okay, I'm, 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 doing, I'm doing pretty good. Well, I want to challenge you. The Bible says if you think you're doing good, think twice. <laughs> so you don't fall. If you're doing good, we say amen to that. But now it's time to get stronger. What's stopping you from getting to the next level? And for those challenges I said earlier, for those who have been, maybe you've fallen this week or this month, you have to understand that there's still grace. You can still get back up, but you have to make a decision to not let anything stop you. Let's make a decision this morning as a family to not let anything stop us from getting up, picking our mat, and walking with God. Let's go to point number two. Point number two, incredible faith. Continue reading in John 5, verse 16. It says, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, he said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day. And I, too, am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. What an interesting moment we see here. Where God is doing miracles. People are getting healed. The blind are seeing. The lame are walking. And people still hated him. And they didn't try to just hurt his feelings. They didn't just try to gossip and slander about him. They tried to kill him. Why? It wasn't because of his preaching. It was because of the fruit. And I think in the same way right now, people are opposing our movement, persecuting our movement. But not just persecuting to hurt our feelings. They're trying to stop it. What was Jesus Christ's response? He said, I, just like my father, am always working. We ain't going to stop. Because if it is the movement of God, you can't stop God. And what's our response to those who are trying to stop God's movement? We're not going to stop working. Because we're just going to be like our father in heaven and keep working and working. And one day we're going to rest in heaven. They're trying to stop it, but who's ready to fight for the Lord this morning? You know, we know James 2 says that faith without deeds is dead. We know when we teach the persecution study, we say, in fact, anyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. And then we say, well, if you're not living godly life, you won't be persecuted. So in the same way in James 2, faith without deeds is dead. Deeds without faith 
is also dead. And that's why in John 14, verse 12, Jesus says, Fairly, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. What an incredibly humble thing for God to say. You see, incredible faith, real faith, is not what we see in our religious society these days. Now, many church services will end with a preacher saying, come if you want to accept Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and say this prayer. And all those people saying those prayers, I was one of those people, and not change a lick of anything. Yeah. Maybe want to go to church, not even read the Bibles, call them a Christian, but not even do the work of God. True faith. The Bible here says that if you believe in Jesus, you would do the things that Jesus did. But you would not even do what Jesus did. You will do even greater things than Jesus. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that you could do even greater things than our Lord? How humble of God to say that. But how much he thinks about you. How highly he thinks about you. That you could do even greater things. Man, God, God raised people from the dead. But every time we help someone get baptized, we're helping someone raise from the dead. God, at the end of his movements, when he preached for three years, had 120 faithful disciples. Right now, in God's modern day movement, there's 10,000 sold out disciples for Jesus Christ. Right now, you're already doing even greater things. But God wants to inspire you this morning to take it higher. But John 14 says, anyone who believes in me will do even greater things. But sometimes we can believe in ourselves more than we believe in God. You know, there's a a difference between doing the work of the Lord for our own selves and our own glory than doing it for God and with God. If you do ministry or work or making disciples, we understand all of us are in the ministry. If you didn't know that, well, congratulations, you've been hired to go into the ministry of Christ. Why is that? Every single one of us, God calls us to go and make disciples. He calls us to go and be fishers of men. So we're all doing the work of the ministry. But when we do it to just impress others, or impress God even, we're going to find ourselves burned out and unfruitful. But if you do the ministry with God, constantly finding where God is moving, and joining in God's activity you will last for the whole lifetime. And I don't know about you, but I want to last for the whole lifetime here. Uh, I, man, I, I'm, I'm a young, I don't know, I think I'm young. I was, I, I, was, I, was, I was talking to someone today, they're like, man, you're approaching 30. How do you feel about approaching 30? It's like, dang, man, um, I, feel, I feel great about it. <laughs> um, but I'm still young in the Lord. 70 years ago, I want to be here forever. Um, I, I want to go to heaven. So how do you know where you're at? Let me, let me give you a little grade report, maybe. A little heart check. To see, it, are you working for results, or are you working with God? If you're working for results, you're sad when no one notices you. You critique leaders. Critique leaders. We, 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 don't, we don't need any journalists here. Like, oh, well, man, they're a little late for service here today. Oh, well, man, I don't really like the way he preached that one. We don't need journalists. We don't need fans either. We need players. We need people who are going to put their hand to the plow, work with incredible faith so we can see more souls be saved. You lack vision. You view disciples as means to your end. Your personal Bible reading and prayer life diminishes. Your joy is based off your performance. You feel shame about your hidden sin. Now, if you're working with God, you expect nothing. You're pleased when no one notices your work. You see the greater vision of small work and celebrate small victories. You view disciples as brothers and sisters. And you see their well-being as more important than the job that's to get done. Your personal Bible reading prayer time is consistent and flourishing. You are happy while you're exhausted. And you confess your sin. I don't know about you, 
But man, God's been doing some awesome things. But the Bible said that God's going to work through us. So here's the thing. When you move, God moves. If you don't move, God's not going to move. So yeah, God's been doing great things, but I feel exhausted. But the thing is, we can be exhausted and continue the pursuit, being fired up in the Lord. Are you fired up this morning? Can, can I confess though? You know? I, I, I think people love when they, the leaders share their sin, you know. We're human beings too. We, we're not perfect. You know, the quote that I opened up with, is, it said, strength doesn't come from what you can do but it comes from overcoming what you once thought you could not do. And being in L.A., this, this, is the, this is the most people I ever led. I went from leading a dinky little region of 20, multiplied it to about 45, 50, and then came here, and they're like, hey, you're going to oversee the West, and you're going to be in the South. I was like, amen, that sounds awesome. Never done it before, but it sounds great. And, and I, I never preached this more before. I never had this much responsibility and, and last week, I found myself tired. Tired. Now, it was a mixture of being tired and exhausted and joyful. But then there's a little hint of just being just to, wow, we're going, we're going hard here. I just felt a little tired there. And as I was praying and fasting uh, for a couple days, God revealed to me, and someone told me this before, but sometimes, you know, even when someone tells you this, you're a little stubborn. You got to kind of figure out the hard way here. What I was doing before, my same quiet times, my prayer times, my walk with God that I did in San Francisco is not enough as I'm doing more for God. The Bible said that Solomon had to lead people as much as the stars, but it also said that he had wisdom as much as the stars. So his wisdom and his faith was equivalent to the amount he was doing. And I, I just saw I need to take it higher in my walk with God. And it reminded me of a passage in 2 Peter 1. Let's go over there. You know, that's how I feel, but I mean, I know sin's kind of like ants. I mean, you got one ant in your house. You don't got one ant. You got a whole, you got a whole village. So I don't know if I'm feeling this way. I know some people are probably feeling this way too. We're the body of Christ, you know what I'm saying? And we're, 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 one, we're one organism. So what happens is, as we go, so does the church. So I hope this passage could inspire us. 2 Peter 1, verse 3, it says, The divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who called us, by his own glory and goodness, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort, do whatever it takes, to add to your faith, incredible faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance. And perseverance, godless, and to God is mutual affection, mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never fall away. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This scripture is amazing. Where it says that God is giving us everything we need through the knowledge of Christ. When you did the first principles Bible studies, that just wasn't a set of Bible studies that we do in our church. Those are the elementary teachings of God's word that now gives you everything you need to live a godly life. And it kind of gives a, 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 a progression where it says, for every reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness. And I don't know about you, but once I became a disciple, I just became a better person. I wasn't, I wasn't a very good person before I became a Christian. 
didn't, didn't want to talk to anybody, just always like secluded by myself, rude and just not really respectful. That was how I was. But you become a good person. When you become a disciple now, you kind of come to church, you're cleaned up a bit. Isn't it awesome you see young disciples start wearing suits? Yeah. Isn't it awesome if they see Artez in a suit over here? Yeah. <laughs> it's great. You know, I was like, wow, you become a good person. You can clean up. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. But then I think the next step where some people don't get to, you got to add to that goodness, knowledge. Your greatest learning should not be in the first principles. You have to learn more. If we want incredible faith, faith is not mystical. Faith is not magical. Faith is mathematical. The more you read the Bible, the more you obey the scriptures, the more incredible faith you're going to have. And God says when we make every effort to do this, we will never fall away. We will never stumble. And here's the thing. God has called us to be a holy nation. God's special possession. His royal priesthood. The apple of his eye. But your ability to make every effort to add to your knowledge, have incredible faith, is going to be the determining factor whether you'll be confirmed in that election. And see God in heaven. We want to have incredible faith? we got to have incredible knowledge in the scriptures. I really want to encourage us and inspire us here this morning. For all the young Christians, it's time to get to really know the Bible. Like, really know the Bible. Like, don't have to call your disciple to do a seeking God study and know the Bible. Uh, get to know the discipleship study. I was, I was inspired to, to hear at Devo, uh, Alan shared some good news, that Bryce led a seeking God Bible study. I was like, that's awesome. Here's a young man who just recently got baptized January 2nd and is going after leading the first principles. But here's the thing, for, even for us who are mature disciples, it's time to increase our knowledge. And the Bible simply teaches in Hebrews 5, chapter 6, once mature, not always mature. It says by constant use. Have you been using the knowledge lately? Have you been getting into Bible studies, having awesome quiet times so that the Bible said that you could be refreshed by God, but then go out and refresh others? That's what incredible faith does, and we need incredible faith all around the Metro Coast Super Region. Because God wants us to do amazing things through us. It's time to have incredible faith. We're just getting started. It's just February. It's just February. That's what I told myself yesterday. It's just February, man. I got it. We have so much more to do. But when you do it with God, you can do it with joy. You can do it with fun. You can do it with family. And it'll be incredibly fruitful. My final point. You do whatever it takes. Have incredible faith. Nothing will be impossible. Point number three. Nothing will be impossible. You know, Mark 10, verse 27, I'm not going to turn there. It says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. Vince Lombardi once said, you know, Super Bowl, we're going to talk about Lombardi here. We could accomplish many more things if we did not think of them as impossible. A Nike ad once said, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in a world they have been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. You know, right now we are in a great campaign. Yes, we are. A great campaign that many have said it's impossible. Don't you know the odds are stacked against us? 
we're, we're not just, guys, we're not just the only group that raises money and plant churches. Our goal is not just to do that. Our goal is to evangelize the nations in this generation. Some will say, that's impossible. But we say impossible is nothing when you do it with the Lord. Even right here in the Metro Coast, in the South Miami, we want to get to 135 disciples. I mean, that's still dinky. I was, I was talking to Pat and Pam, and they were telling me when the, they saw hundreds in the Southland, thousands in the L.A. church. A, a lot of us who are in the new movement never saw that. So we're like, wow, can we see thousands in L.A.? I mean, the, the past is not our standard. What's in front of us is not the standard. Our standard is the word of God. And the word of God, thousands came to Christ even in just one day in the book of Acts. So can we see thousands in the Southland? Can we see thousands in the West? Of course. Impossible is nothing. I mean, in the West, we want to get to 100 for the Lord this year. It's going to be a gauntlet. But impossible is nothing. And our goal is like this, these numbers are not just numbers. Don't see it like that. Every number, every baptism, every restoration, every place membership, that's a soul. That's a soul. To see 100 in the West, 135 in the Southland, that's 100 and, 100, and that's 235 sold out disciples that are one day going to go to heaven. You see, our goal is not just to increase our numbers. Our goal is to get to heaven. And God's just getting started. Now, this is awesome to see all that God is doing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so cool, you know, being, being here in the South. And I believe, just as like I said earlier, there's so much more new things. And, uh, you know, last night, Regina and I had an awesome pleasure to get into a Bible study with our amazing new friend, Lynn, over here. <laughs> and let me tell you, right, like, I, I told you, I've, I've been inside been for seven years, you know, almost, almost seven years. My wife been inside for seven years. She kind of beat me to it, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're getting there. Lynn got baptized in the 80s in eastern Illinois. <laughs> if you don't know, that was Kip's first <laughs> ministry he led. And they baptized over 300 people in one year in one campus. And I'm, I'm sure people have fact-checked me on this if I got the right facts here, but I think that's, that, is, that is right. <laughs> and we got a chance to uh, get with uh, Lynn last night. I want to lift up Paul and Kim Hammond in a great way. Um, it's amazing, you know, to see them spearhead to get more remnant disciples. And I, what Lynn said was quite inspiring to me. With conviction. She read 1 Corinthians 3, where it says you got to build with costly stones, not wood, hay, or straw. And it says those who build with wood, hay, or straw, they may make it, but there'll be one escaping through the flames. Crawling, not thriving, barely making it. And she said, I don't want to be one escaping through the flames. I want to be on fire for God. And next week, Lynn will be placing membership here in God's new movement. I mean, church, do you see what God is doing? So far in the year, in the L.A. church, 39 souls have been baptized into Christ. And 16 have been restored. More than daily baptisms for the Lord. And here in the Metro Coast in six weeks, we have seen eight baptisms, more than weekly additions for God. God is saying, nothing is impossible when you do it with the Lord. And I'd be right now. It's time for us to go out these doors and share faith. When it's uncomfortable, we might be at the gym. You see the biggest guy there. Go share faith with him. When, when, when you're in the checking line and you're like, oh, I, just kind of, I don't want to hold the line, just forget about holding the line. Share your faith with that person. 
When you go out to lunch today, go share your faith with that person. It's time for us to do point number one, whatever it takes. Take the W. Point number two, have incredible faith. Take the I. Point number three, nothing is impossible. Take the N. What does that spell? Win. What are we here to do? We are with our God bent on conquest. We are here to win the West. We're here to win Southland. We're here to win the Metro Coast. And to God be 